once again to Church 242. Uh, my name is uh, Pastor Craig Hamilton. Um, so uh, I, it throws a wrench into my entire sermon today. Um, for this reason, the entire sermon was off of a video that I was going to show you. <laughs> like the whole thing was like, I was going to show you this awesome video. It was like a spoken word. And what he says is like super encouraging. And like when I heard it, I was like getting wrecked by it, which just means I was really feeling emotional by it. Um, I had to define that sometimes. Um, so I, like, it was just, it was just really awesome. And so when we showed up to church this morning and we realized that we weren't going to have any power, and therefore no sound system, therefore no video. Um, I ran to my truck and I just sat in my truck and said, all right, God, now what? <laughs> um, and so what I'm going to do today is I just kind of want to share my heart with y'all. Is that good? Yes. And just kind of some of the things that the Lord has been sharing with me in my walk and in my journey. And I pray that that would help you guys out a little bit. Is that, Yeah. Three of you, we're good. All right. The next thing is, it's because it's like, if you laugh just a little, I can't hear it. So I'm going to crack jokes and you guys won't laugh and I'm going to feel insecure. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> and I'm going to be like, ah, nobody laugh. All right, just keep moving. Um, it's weird because the camera picks it up. So when I rewatch these things, I'm like, oh, people were laughing. Oh, I felt like a moron for no reason. So, all right. Um, we have been in this journey um, for Church 242 for a while. The last time that I came up and, and, I, and I spoke um, was not last week, because last week we had uh, uh, Sean here. And um, just real quick shout out, um, if you guys want to hear Sean and more of that love stuff that he was talking about, the, just how he sees love, how love comes out through the Bible, um, his material is really good. And we have him um, um, for the entire month of March on a Wednesday night. Uh, those are our Wednesday night fellowships. Um, if I had a little flyer, I'd show it to you. But Wednesday nights, uh, 6.30 to 8.30, uh, Sean is, be, is going to be uh, sharing just the concept of love. And there was a, uh, some of you there. We had a good chunk of you guys there uh, last Wednesday, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, it, was, it was really yes, good. Yay, see? Some of you liked it. That's good. Uh, Sean is, is, like I said, a good friend, dear friend of mine. And, um, but the week prior to that, before he came and spoke, um, I just shared the demographics of, of basically Rancho Cucamonga. And I shared with you guys that there is a need out there um, to really to press in and to really understand that there's so much more for us to do than just say, I believe in God and therefore I'm good, so forget everybody else. Did that make sense? There has to be something else for us. There has to be more for us. And God has called you into basically, and I can't say this because if I say this, it sounds bad. But it, like, like in the scriptures, it talks about this. And I've heard pastors say this uh, like a hundred times. But basically when you say yes to God, you like enlist in an army, right? Because there's a battle going on. But now those terms, they don't sound good because a lot of people are like, no, fighting's bad, right? No, yeah. So the reality is, what did he call you into then? Well, what he called you into is a relationship, not just with him, but with his whole family. And the reality is, is his whole family is everybody. He wants everybody. There is not a man, woman, or child on this planet that he does not care about. It tells us in the scriptures, he wishes that none should perish. None. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. Now, I'm not sitting here preaching that, oh, so everybody gets to go to heaven. That's not what I'm saying, okay? What I'm saying, though, is his desire... It's for you all, all of his people, to go to heaven. And I, I need to share this with you because I need to explain heaven to you. Because sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't. And I was under the impression for a very long time that heaven was a place um, wherever it was, whether outer space or wherever. Like Heaven was a place... That awesome things were at. Like there's a mansion, streets are like gold. Like, you know, you've heard these things, right? And it's beautiful and I'm gonna be like rich. You know, like, because if the streets are gold, why wouldn't I be rich, right? Because whatever they have in heaven for money, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm gonna get jewels. I mean, I am like, and all I was thinking about, and this is the best way I can describe it. I think so many of us look at heaven as if heaven is like Disneyland. And that's what we're trying to get into. We're trying to get into Disneyland. And the cost to get into Disneyland is way too high a price. <laughs> and the price keeps going 
going up, <laughs> unless you live in Southern California. Um, <laughs> listen, the reality becomes, it's a lot to get into Disneyland, and guess what? There's a high price to get into heaven as well, because the price is literally your life. And, and this is what I thought, and this is where, this is where things get a little like, mixed up, and I wanna, I wanna walk you through this, is that okay? Yes? Yeah. If I, the cost to get into heaven is really high, and I already accepted Jesus, and I get in, I, I get into with Jesus. The reality is, I don't feel like that's enough. So what happens is, is I feel like I have to do works in order to get into heaven. And what happens is, is you start to have different denominations break forth because it's no longer the grace of Christ that allows you into heaven. It's now not only just the grace, but the works as well. Are you guys following me on this one? And here's the thing. Some of you guys are like, no, Craig, I know that it's Jesus, the blood of Christ on the cross. Easter's coming up. I know that that's it. But the reality is when you start to look at your life, you feel like you're not doing enough. So that doesn't make any sense, does it? If I don't feel like I'm doing enough and I feel like I have to do works, but yet I already understand that I'm saved, what's the point? The reality is, is this, are you ready? I'll, I'll help you out with this. You're gonna keep finding yourself in that circle, feeling like you're not good enough, feeling like you haven't done enough to get into heaven. And you're gonna say, God, why would you even like me? And you have that repetitive thing over and over and over again. But that's because you're trying to get into a place that we think is like this. Heaven is not a place. I'm going to throw that out there. You can debate me theologically later, okay? Heaven's not a place. Heaven is a man. Let me say it one more time. Heaven's not a place. Heaven is a man. And his name is? Jesus. Jesus. Now, see, you, you understand that, but I want you to get this. Because here's the, the concept. The only reason why heaven is absolutely beautiful and amazing is not because of the mansions. It's not because of the streets of gold. It's not because of the jewels that you get or the robes that you wear. The reason heaven is an absolute amazing place is because he's there. So, therefore, heaven is not a place. Heaven is a man. Therefore, if this is the concept, the slums of L.A. is heaven if Jesus is standing in them. Are you guys following me on this one? Because now this changes the entire game. It changes your thinking. Because now I'm not trying to get into a place. And now I need to have a relationship with somebody. And I think this is where in the world we, get it, we miss it. We, we try to preach heaven through Jesus. But the reality is we need to forget about heaven and just preach Jesus. Because if you don't have a relationship with him, you don't get in. There's that scary verse, Matthew chapter 7, when he looks at you and he says, Away from me, I don't know who you are. But wait, God, I went to church all the time. I, I did all these things in your name. I did all these things for you, Jesus. And he once again looks and he says, I'm sorry. I don't know you. I don't want that to be for you. We watched a spoken word last week, excuse me, two weeks ago, that kind of shared that. The guy got into this thing. He described heaven. It was absolutely beautiful. It's called The Gate. Um, if you have never seen it, it's by Chris Webb. Go online. It's all over the place. It's a, it's a, a very powerful spoken word. And the reality is, it, it, he gets to this whole thing. And he looks at him face to face and he goes, do I know you? And the reality becomes this. Do you know him? Do you know God? Do you know Jesus? Not do you think about him? Do you have a relationship with him? Because here's what happens. Are you guys ready? If I'm trying to do works to get into heaven so I can be next to him, I'm not a friend, I'm a slave. This is why Jesus uh, tells his disciples, you are no longer slaves. Why? Because you know the business of the Father. You know what we're trying to do. Therefore, because you know the Father's business, you are no longer a slave, you are a friend. Friends get you into higher places, right? It's not what you know, it's who you know. Isn't that, isn't that it? Notice how things on the earth kind of match things up in heaven. I'm just saying, right? It's who you know. And the question becomes, do you know him? Like, yeah, Craig, I know him. I've been to church. It's awesome. That's great. It's kind of like that friend that you call once a year. And that friend doesn't want to ever pick up that phone call because they know you just want something. See, you, you know who I'm talking about, right? You guys, four, four people in your mind just came out. Oh my God, I hope Billy doesn't call me. You know, why? Because every time you see that number come up, you're like, ah oh man, they want something again. 
And you never want to be that person. But the reality is, that's how sometimes we treat God. I'm only going to hang out with you, God, when I want something. I'm only going to hang out with you, God, because I need something in this moment. I'm only going to hang out with you because I, 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 I. And we have to flip the script at some point. I just spit that was gross. Um, we have to basically flip it at some point and say it's no longer about me. And why can I say that? Because I know the Father's business was never about us personally. It was about his entire kingdom. Did that make sense? I want us to get into a kingdom mindset from now on to move forward. Why can I sit back and I can say, I believe, uh, I'm going to say this. I'm going to have to work out the theology through it in, in, at a later date. But you know that, 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 that concept, um, excuse me, the Lord's Prayer? You got anybody know the Lord's Prayer? Yeah. Come on, where are my Catholics at? Yeah. Right? How does it start? I'm trying to get you guys involved. I know it's cold. Come on. What? Yeah. How do I name thy kingdom? Yeah. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As in heaven, right? Now I have a question for you. Here's where the theology gets a little like, well, wait a second, Craig, if heaven's not a place, why would you want, like, why is it saying heaven on earth? Easy, because Jesus is on earth. The kingdom came. This is why he said, go tell everybody the kingdom is at hand. Yes. Are you, did, no? Yeah. One guy, I mean, come on, but like, do you get this? Why does he say, go tell everybody the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom is before you? Why? Because he literally came to earth. And what is our job from now on? It is to continue to keep that kingdom here. And how do I keep that kingdom here? I live out what Jesus lived out. And that's my job. That is my, who I am. And the best part about it is, I know I screwed up. I said it's my job, but it's not a job. It's a desire. It's a want. I want to go live. Listen, I want to pray for people because I literally believe that God can heal people. I literally believe that. You know why? I've seen it. Can you imagine the first healing that Jesus did? Those disciples did not believe. You cannot tell me that. They're like, oh, you're a good rabbi. What, you're going you're gonna to do what with the little girl? You're going to raise her from the dead? I got to see this. No, you guys can't. I'm just going to take Peter. School, right? You know? <laughs> like, what? And he's like, yeah, you know? And then, and it takes Peter, and Peter gets to see this little girl raised from the dead. His entire theology at that moment was gone. I always tell people this. Listen, I, I was, I was, I was diehard, like, Baptist, conservative Baptist. And that's my roots. That's where I grew up. And there's nothing bad at all about that in any way, shape, or form. Matter of fact, I'm glad that I have that. You want to know why? Because in a conservative um, denomination, they root themselves in the word. And that's, and I love that. And I'm glad that that was my background. I'm glad I didn't get the emotional part after that. Because sometimes when you get like that feeling part, the, the healing and that, sometimes it's not rooted in the word. But because I knew the word so well, when I saw something happen, I went immediately to the scripture and I said, how is this real? And that's literally my story. I literally saw a miracle happen and I could not, I could not justify it. I couldn't sit back and say, and here's the next thing. I, I talked to a lot of my friends and they were like, um, the miracle that I saw was I watched a lady's leg grow out. And uh, if you ever have a chance to see that, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> it was incredible. She had one of those shoes that was like, you know what I mean? That had the thicker sole because her balance was that. It was off by a couple inches. It was crazy. Some of you were there that day, huh? You remember that day? Like crazy. Anyways, it was the rumble. Did anybody remember? Yeah. Sorry. And, it was, and, this, and this leg grew out, and I was like, oh! By the way, just so you know, it was, it was the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. It was weird. It's, it's weird. It's not like, oh my God, it's crazy. It was like, uh, uh, um. <laughs> I mean, literally, that, that was literally the reaction. It was like, ah. Uh. Here's the thing. I knew the woman. I knew her. She was not part of some conspiracy to make people believe or anything. It was none of that. It was this girl had a problem. The guy prayed, her leg grew out, and it was the grossest thing I've ever seen. And then I had to go back to my chair, and I sat there, put my head in my hands, and I said, God, if this is you, I'm lost. I need to understand some things. Now, I went and I talked with people. I did. I talked with lots of people, way smarter than me. And the only people that I knew were, were conservatives. The only people I knew were rooted in the Bible. And they kept telling me, Craig, what you saw was a demon thing. Well, time out. If the demons can do it, why isn't God doing it still? 
Well, I don't know why God's not doing it still, but we just know that that's demonic. So I'm a little lost. Now, is that your opinion or is this a theology that we have to land on? They're like, well, it's really more of our opinions because we don't know if it's of God or not. And I'm like, I saw everybody there. A kingdom is not, a kingdom that stands against this, or a kingdom that is divided cannot stand, right? Every single person that was right there was praising the name of Jesus Christ, was praising the Lord. Amen? That, that ain't the devil to me. Changed my whole philosophy. And what am I, why am I sharing all of this? I have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm sharing this because that's the kingdom at hand. I'm not saying you have to heal. I'm just saying, why not go for it? If we believe in who Jesus says that he is, the reality says, he says, do as I do. Therefore, why not pray? And let's believe that he can do something. So when you see somebody walking around on crutches, when you see somebody and you feel that like, now, don't go, don't, don't get haywire on me here, okay? Don't be one of those Jesus freaks where you're running around and you're like, I see people with crutches, right? Like, <laughs> unless the Lord tells you to, then it's okay just to be like, man, God, I really hope you do something in your life. But if the Lord strikes your heart and you're walking by, and some of you, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've had these moments where you're walking by and the Lord just kind of says something, do this. And you're like, I don't, I don't know them. It doesn't matter. You go and you do it. Because when the Lord speaks, we have to move. When the Lord asks us to do something, we have to go. There's no if, ands, or buts. You just do it. And this is the story I want to share with you today. It comes to us from Nehemiah. And when I was sitting in my car uh, this morning, when I was like, well, everything's gone haywire, God. What do you want to do? He was sharing these stories. He was reminding me of these things. And then he said, I want you to just go right to Nehemiah because Nehemiah is going to be where we need to land anyways. And I said, okay, God, what are you talking about? If you guys have never read uh, the book of Nehemiah, um, go for it. It is a book in the Old Testament. And I'm going to read you like an entire chapter. Is that cool? I see some of you guys are like, no, Craig, please, why, let it start raining, um, <laughs> uh, I know I'm not the, the best reader in the world, and there's nothing to really follow, but this is a good reason why you should have one of these handy when you come to church, uh, sometimes PowerPoint don't work, all right, Nehemiah, I want you to read uh, the first part to you, and it says this, um, Nehemiah is, is talking with some of his Jewish uh, brothers. And he says, one of my brothers came with, a certain, uh, with certain men from Judea. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning, uh, concerning Jerusalem. Verse 3. And they said to me, the remnant there in the providence who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. And some of you went, well, those are, okay, what? Let me explain what happened. You have, two, uh, you have two parts of the kingdom of Israel. At this point, you have the northern section, which is called Israel. You have the southern section called Judea. If you wondered why we call Israelites Jews, it's from the kingdom of Judea. Everybody with me? Some of you just clicked and went, oh, I was always wondering that, okay? The northern part, when the, when, the king, when the kingdom split, you have the northern part and the southern part. The northern part was, the capital was Sumeria, where you get your Samaritans. <laughs> See? See, it's clicking now, right? The southern, the southern part is Judea, and that has your Jerusalem in it. It has your temple. It had all that stuff. You ready? You guys walking to me? There is another kingdom at hand, the, and, and what happens in 722, I think it is, um, BC, um, the, the northern gets taken over. And then most of Judea starts to get taken over, and it leaves one little spot, and that's Jerusalem. Jerusalem gets, gets like left alone and literally they have like these gates, they have these, I mean, they, they don't touch the temple, but in 586, okay, it actually probably started in 597, but you don't care about numbers, so I'm going to keep moving, okay? 586 BC, Babylon comes in and takes over Jerusalem and Israel completely, Judah, Israel, all of it is no more. Are you guys with me on this one? 
what happened was, and, and, and these are the gods of the Chaldeans, okay? And the Chaldeans are these wizards, these sorcerers, and you're going to have um, your, all these kings. If you guys know the Babylonian story, you guys know that the kings are not good kings. They're bad, and they didn't like our gods. They had their gods. Everybody still walking with me on this one? What happened was, is the king said, I want all of the Jews out. If you were anybody in power as a Jewish man or a woman, you are gone. Obviously, it was just the men at the time because the women were just connected to the men. Everybody with me? You're gone. You know who they left? The remnant? Who they left? Were the people that were not in power. So all the priests were taken away. All the people with money were taken away. It was just people like you and me. Let's just say. Just you and me. We were left because we didn't hold a position of power. Well, I would have been kicked out because I'm a pastor. But you all would have been like, you're safe, okay? Now, we would have been kicked out, okay? Now, Nehemiah is obviously not in, he's not there. So we know that he's part of the exile. Does that make sense? He's part of the taking out. So which means he had a prominent position somewhere in, in Judah. Did that make sense? Everybody with me? So he asked the question, what's going on with our brothers and sisters? What's happening in, in Jerusalem? What's going on? And he says, it's not good. The remnant, the people that were there, the gates are burned, the walls are knocked down. It's like we don't even exist. That's what's being said here. It's like we don't even exist. Now I gotta get this in, in your guys' hearts. The Jewish people and God were still there. They just didn't live it out. They bowed down to the other kings. Matter of fact, they started naming their children after the Chaldean gods. Are you guys with me on this one? They literally conformed. Are you with me? They conformed to their culture instead of trying to help the culture conform to what God was trying to do. Sound familiar? Yeah. Nehemiah hears this. And now if you want to know where Nehemiah is, Nehemiah is in, in Persia, okay? He's hanging out in, in Persia and he's hanging out with the king um, Artaxerxes, which basically means that we're going to figure out the name later. I don't know why they call all the Persian kings Artaxerxes, okay? That's really not their real name in the scripture. In history, they have other names. And in this case, it might be King Cyrus, in case you guys are, are following along in history. No history buffs? Cool. I'll keep moving then. His name is Ronald McDonald. All right, moving forward. <laughs> oh, the wind. This is going to be fun. All right. Nehemiah gets the news. He asks the question now. Now, when I read this, it's going to make a little bit more sense, right? It says, the remnant there in the province who survived the exile in the great trouble and shame. The, in, uh, in My bad. See, I don't know how to read. Who survived um, the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, oh God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before day and night before the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned, uh, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded for your servant Moses. Freeze. No, it's freezing. It's freeze. No, uh, <laughs> that's a wrong terminology. When was the last time that you had such a holy discontent that it put you to your knees and you wept and you started to confess sins that weren't even yours? Are you guys with me on this one? We have become a society. I'm lumping everybody in. Yes, I, I'm doing the lump thing. But listen, we have become a society where we just don't care about somebody else anymore. We've become a society where we can walk down the street, see somebody going to hell, knowing that they're, not, they're, they're living against God and say, you know what? 
That's their thing, not mine. I know Jesus, I'm out. Does that make sense? When was the last time that you had a holy discontent for something? And let's just be real, it's gonna be different for all of you. It's gonna be different for all of you. Some of you, you're gonna hear about human, uh, uh, human trafficking. And you're just, it's going gonna, it's gonna to break you. Some of you guys, you're going to hear about divorces that are going on in your neighborhoods. And those type of things are going to break you. There's some of you that it's just like there are people going to hell and it is going to break you. I have a question. What is your holy discontent? And how do you know it's your holy discontent? I think it's simple. It's your holy discontent because you can't stop thinking about it. You get emotional and you get fired up and you get angry sometimes when you start hearing about these certain things. Are you guys with me on this one? It becomes a holy discontent and you need to stay and you need to take action. When you start to feel those emotions, when you start to have those things from the Lord, it is from the Lord. You are supposed to step up. Are you with me on this one? Nehemiah sits down and he weeps for days. He prays and he fasts for days. And then he just starts to confess sins that aren't even his. He starts confessing sins for Israel. He starts confessing all these things. And then he goes to himself and he says, God, even I, even I have screwed up and I have not done what has been asked. But I am asking you, Father, I need you to hear me now. Are you guys with me on this one? I'm asking you today, what is your holy discontent? What is that fire that, that, that burns? Maybe some of you guys, and I, listen, I, I'm, trying to get, I, I'm trying to get you to start thinking about this stuff. Maybe it's children. Maybe you have a desire and a heart for children. And you're like, man, it, it burns me when I start seeing children that pass away. Or it burns me when I start seeing children that are abused. And maybe God's asking you, I need you to step in and step up. And guess what? When this desire starts to burn in you, it changes your entire life. I'm just going to be real. I'm going to be honest. You might have a job shift because it might change everything. And it's going to be hard. It's never easy. It's going to be hard. But I want to read the rest of this to you because this is, this is what happens in Nehemiah. He gets a holy discontent. And he starts to press in and he starts praying. And his first prayer, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to mention it to you. Then I'm going to read what, what happens next. But he says this in verse, uh, verse 8, uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. It says this, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. Do you know that sometimes we have to remind God some of the things that he said? Did you guys know that? Now, why do we really have to, do we really have to remind him like he forgot? But do you know what happens when you have a holy discontent? You start to pull things out. You start to use all your cards. Does that make sense? You start to pull it out and be like, hey, remember these things? I, like, now, I'm, now, now, I'm, now I'm using all these. What am I talking about? Hey, God, you promised me that you would always be there for me. I'm asking you to show up now. Do you, are you guys with me on this one? And that's what he is. He's at a place in his life where he's like, God, I know that you're in heaven. I know that you love me. I know all this stuff. But God, now's the time to step in. Now's the time, and he gets, and, and he, he just goes nuts. So you guys ready for this? I love this. The last sentence in, in, chapter, um, in chapter one is this, okay? Um, the last verse, excuse me, it says this. Oh, Lord, let, uh, let, um, I don't know where I'm reading. Hold on. Okay, all right. Let your ear be attentive to the prayers of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight uh, to revere your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this, in the sight of this man. And he says, now I was a cupbearer to the king. Just a random thing. In case you guys are wondering, cupbearer to the king, I won't take a long time to explain this. But basically this, um, the, one of the biggest ways that kings would pass on was it would be poisoned and it would be through their food and so whatever nehemiah is nehemiah is not expendable nehemiah has such a love for the king and has such a, a an honor and a respect for the king that the king needs to have his closest buddy next to him anytime he eats food this is not just a random guy does this make sense he's not pulling somebody out of the crowd and be like you eat this no, it's got to be somebody that's close to him and his family. He has to have a relationship with him because he knows that, that if this guy can literally poison his food at any time. Are you guys with me? So he has to have somebody close to him. You know who else he's close to? His wife. Because whatever the food the king eats, the wife eats. So the wife needs to make sure that this person is well taken care of and loved and is connected. Are you guys with me on that one? 
these are not just some random people. He is, he is high up, or he is a high ranking official, even though we call him the cupbearer. But he is the one that tastes the food. Are you all with me? Awesome. It says this. In the 12th year of the king, uh, King Xerxes, Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, get it, the wine before him, he's the cup bearer. Thanks for following everybody. All right. I took up the wine and I, I, took, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had been sad in his presence. Let me rephrase that. It says this, now I had not been sad in his presence. Why is that even... Why do you need to say that? Do you want to know? Historically, you were not allowed to be sad in front of the king. If you were, you were removed and put in prison. You literally had to walk in with a fake smile. I'll use Disneyland as the other example. All employees at Disneyland have to smile. And if they're not, they're fired. I'm not even joking. That's like a real like rule at, at Disneyland. So if you see somebody not smiling, be like, mm, I'm telling. <laughs> That's if you can get into Disneyland. All right, so. <laughs> Listen, you had to smile. So he's never, ever been sad inside of, the, uh, inside of the king. And it says this. And the king said to me, why is your face sad? Seeing you are not sick. He's like, you're not sick. Something else is wrong. He says this. Uh, uh, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then Nehemiah was very much afraid, and he said, he said, very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Dude, he just went all in. Like, it's not like, you know what, I'll be fine. Do you know that sometimes you guys miss the blessing in your life because you choose to hide what you're going through? I'll say it again a little slower because people need to hear this. Sometimes you miss the favor and the blessing in your life because you choose to hide what you're going through. Nobody can help you if they don't know how to help you. Okay? So we need to be real with people. But we live in a society that says, no, shh, don't tell, hide. That is the enemy and it always has been. Okay? So he says this. He just goes all in and he says, Why? You know, the graves lies in ruins. The gates are destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what are you requesting? I don't think Nehemiah was ready for that. Just like sometimes when we say things, we're not ready for the, for the answer. Everybody still with me? Goes on. What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Do you think he stopped right in front of the king or took a day or four and said, let me go pray about it and I'll be back to you? No? More likely not. What he's saying is, in those moments, you need to start praying. You don't have to pray out loud. You can pray in your heart. And you start praying and say, God, you need to be with me right now. In this moment, I need you right now. And we need to learn that. We need to learn how to have those habits of when I, I, I need to be able to pray at any moment, at any time, and still listen to what's going on. Everyone with me on that one? Moving forward. So I prayed to the God of heaven. And he said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if, it, if your servant has, not found, has found favor in your eyes, let you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. Verse 6. And the king said to me, and in quotations, the queen was sitting beside him. Why, was, why is this noted? Because the, if he's asking to leave, what does that mean for them? They could die. This, is, this could be a death sentence for them because they trust Nehemiah. They understand who he is and he's now asking to leave. Do you guys see how this is kind of a big deal? She's sitting there. It says this, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, uh, to send me when I had given him a time. Verse seven, and I said to the king, if, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to governor to, to the governors of the providence beyond the river that they may uh, let me pass through until I come to Judah. Verse 8. And a letter to Ashpha, uh, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, uh, the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the walls of the city, for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. This is what he asked. 
Listen, this is why I'm sad. I am asking, can I leave? Yeah, you can leave. Hey, by the way, when I leave, can you give me authority? Uh, okay. Oh, by the way, when I leave, can you fund the whole project? Uh, sure, let's do that. Signed off. Why? Because when the Lord calls you, when he sends you, he not only just sends you, but he gives you the authority in the situations and he will fund it. So if that is the promise, if that is what he does, then why do we feel like we're always in lack? We need to get to a place in our lives where we say, the Lord is real, kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand, and we need to start pressing into what the Lord has for us. And what does he have for us? He's sending us, he has authority for us, and he's about to fund everything. Amen. You just need to press in. That's what he does. Why? Because he's a good father. But he does it when you're ready and have a holy discontent. Why do you need a holy discontent for this to happen? Because this... You have to be understand, you can't be wavering at all. You have to be unwavering in these moments. You have to stand fast in these moments. Like this morning is a great example. And by the way, our new series is called Unwavering, A Story of Obedience. And we're going to walk that right into the cross on Easter. So it's funny that we started a, 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 an entire, or an entire uh, series on the concept of being unwavering and we can't get into the school where we do church. I think the question this morning for our staff and me was this, you still going to have church? Do you have a holy discontent to still do this? Does this city still matter to your people? Is this really, does it matter that you have bathrooms? Does it matter what you have? Or do you have a holy discontent to say, we need to keep pressing in? So what? We have to break a lock. We'll buy a new one. He'll fund it. It's good. <laughs> right? I think he's also telling us this. We're not going to be at this school forever because there's more things that we have to do. There's more things that God wants to press into with us. And guess what? When we press into him, he'll fund it. He'll give us authority in places we need authority. Why? Because he's already sent us. Yeah. We're already moving. And you've got to read it. Listen, if this is sparking something in you, I pray, read the story of Nehemiah. It's absolutely amazing. Because guess what? When he shows up to rebuild the wall, do you think people were excited? They get mad at him. Have you ever had that happen? We try to do something good and somebody comes back and goes, what are you trying to do? And you're like, oh my gosh, I just want to love you. <laughs> and, and what happens? They get to us and they get to us so bad that we just go, you know what? Forget it. I'm not dealing with them. And when somebody else comes next, guess what you say to them? Been there, done that, not helping. We have to have an unwavering lifestyle where we press into God because he's called us to do something. Amen. I have no idea if I've been talking for a really long time. There's no clocks. So I apologize if I was talking a little bit too long. But here's where I want to go. I want to press into God and I want to uh, do worship. And I want to just uh, worship him. That's your cue. Come on. Up. Um, I just want to press into God. And as we are pressing into God, I, I just want you to pray for yourselves. Here's what I want you to do as we're in worship. I want you to just start praying for you. And say, God, what is my holy discontent? God, am I pressing into where I need to press in? And here's the thing. Some of you in this place, you found it. You know your holy discontent and you've been pressing in. And I'm just going to ask you to ask God for more. More favor. More authority. Ask God for more, more land. Ask God to do more with you so that you can continue to press into what you've already been doing. Does this make sense? Because listen... This is what we got to get to. And I'll be honest with you. At this church, we want to we wanna raise up all your holy discontents. And I hope they're not the same. Listen, if we have ministries that we don't offer here, you're like, well, Craig, I'd like to go to your church, but you don't have this ministry. Why don't you come and talk to me? And then why don't you start it? That's good. It's so easy. Listen, it's not about leadership here. It's about you doing what God has asked you to do. That's the whole point of Church 242. What do we do? We gather together. We eat together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? We pray together, we've done that. We, 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 we have fellowship together, we teach and we learn together. And then what do we do? It says the spirit falls and we move forward and God adds to our numbers. Not because we're trying to build something, it's because we're trying to spread the kingdom of God. That's what we're trying to do, amen? I'm, I'm done, I'll, I'll shut up, I'm sorry. So, Father, just want them to, I, I just want your people to have a holy discontent, Father. Give it to them, God. 
Give it to them in, 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 in a mighty dose, God, that they would literally start to weep for their discontent, Father. And that, God, you would open doors for them to run into it. So, Holy Spirit, I just thank you for this moment. I thank you for these people. And as we worship right now, Father God, I ask, Father God, that your spirit would just be um, so evident in this place. So, Lord, thank you for this time.